All right. Now, if everything went well, we should have Marion-Lain Visser again with us today. Um, she will talk on the viewpoint of farms and food literacy and how, how our health depends on it. Visser did her undergraduate studies in agricultural sciences and graduate work in applied biological sciences at Ghent University. She specialized in native seed production to restore degraded arid lands and followed her postdoctoral fellowship at the Environmental Change Institute at the National University of Ireland in Galway on sustainable grazing of turlow habitats, a karst wetland protected by the EU, EU Natura 2000 legislation. This postdoctorate enabled her to get back in touch with the debate on nature conservation versus food production on European farmlands. Since 2006, she is a full-time lecturer in farming systems and ag agroecology at the Université Libre de Bruxelles. Her research interests can be united under the banner of agroecology in the broadest sense, explicitly recognizing also the social and political dimensions of food systems research. Her unit promotes work uh, on the development of transdisciplinary research methods with an emphasis on the human dimension of food systems in both temperate and tropical conditions. Marjolaine, I hope you're there and uh, good luck with your presentation. Um, hello, thank you. Um, thank you for this introduction as well. Thanks also to the previous speakers. Um, Katrine, uh, Mats and Tim for having tried to make the darkest history, the darkest chapter our, of our human history a bit less dark. And I'm sorry to say I'm going to make it darker again first. And I hope to end with some more uplifting uh, tips on, on how to um, make this reconnection happening where I've been working on for many, many years between food, farming, uh, nature, and our own health. Okay. I have an outline. So um, we are going to talk about um, cheap food as a false promise first. We're going to limit ourselves to uh, the European Union to talk about all this. Um, why is it a false promise? Because it had caused at the first hand an, an, an enormous health crisis, but also a bio, di biodiversity crisis. I'm not going to talk about climate change. We all, already had this in the previous ones. And then to end and to make it a bit more positive, I'm going to show ways of tackling the double crisis through a new prism on food. Sorry, I'm one, one too much. There is a lag in the... Okay. There is a lag in the, in the reaction. Okay. This is the... Um, the principles of the IFOAM, the International Federation of Organic Farm Movements, um, they say they strive for healthy food, ecological food, fair food, and food that has been prepared and produced with care. I barred the word organic because I think that is what agriculture should be. Um, but unfortunately, we are not there at all. Um, in my uh, research group, we work on the, a shared vision on the far food farming ne nexus to make it more ecological, fair, with more care and um, um, more health. So the question is, how can we adequately feed ourselves while ensuring a livelihood for farmers in dignity? We haven't talked about this uh, today, and while fostering the integrity of ecosystems and biodiversity, both locally and globally. As you can see, it's a very broad transdisciplinary question. I'm not going to answer it today. I'm going to delve into one detail. Well, it's not really a detail. It's the elephant in the room. 
um, that we should really uh, look into the face and act on it. So this is the kind of landscapes we are dreaming of. We can imagine that food that is being produced in those landscapes with a lot of ecological energies, a lot of trees, grass, um, uh, field edges, uh, a lot of nature there, the food that comes from, from such a landscape will um, obey the criteria of the of, uh, IFUAM. But in reality, we have something like this, you know, um, uh, monocultures over enormous expenses, um, large-scale farm operations, um, and we all know, I'm not going to re repeat it, but we all know that um, this is the type of agriculture that is uh, part and parcel of our health crisis and our biodiversity crisis. So that's what I'm going to um, focus on. What's a common factor between both crises, because it's in fact one crisis, um, it's that there are enormous hidden costs. We have already talked about this. The Sustainable Food Trust in the UK has done an exercise on what they call um, true cost accounting. And um, through this exercise, we understand how expensive our food has become. Uh, there's just a false promise of cheapness in the, in the supermarket, but the hidden costs are at least as much as what we really pay for it. We pay for it um, uh, in the form of uh, subsidies to farmers to keep them uh, alive. We uh, pay them uh, um, because of the, all the damage to biodiversity and ecosystems, and we pay another time um, to, um, uh, because we have health problems. And what I want to show you is that the, the estimates for um, um, repairing our health are in fact to be added to the estimates for repairing our uh, e uh, ecosystems and biodiversity. It's two sides of the same coin. So the health crisis, that's what Stefan asked me. What are, what can you talk, but what can you say about the link between the way we farm, the way we eat and our health? And one of the major um, health, health problems we as a westernized society have today is um, this should come now. We don't know anymore what we are eating. Huh? We are um, eating food that is completely disconnected from the uh, place where it has been grown, growing. There is a lot of uh, talk today about ultra processed foods. I'm going beyond ultra processed foods. Where does this food come from? And what is the issue, the real issue with um, growing the ingredients for ultra processed foods? I'm showing you a long list of diseases. Sorry, this is a, a list I've written in French. I didn't have the time to translate it, but I think you must all understand what it is about. So I just give you a few seconds to go through the list. So the question is, what do all those diseases have in common? Is it our Western lifestyle? Is it the pollution coming from traffic and industry? Is it the chemical pollution inside our houses? What could it be? It, it's probable that all those factors have something to do with it, but there's, there's something more. This is what they have in common. They are fairly new to humanity and they are much more um, uh, common in Western countries compared to the South, the Global South. They are not contagious. They are really linked to the way we live and the, the way we 
um, uh, behave. Their incidence is rising at an increasing rate. I could have written at an alarming rate. It's really very worrying. And for Belgium, the statistics are not really very good. I had to rely on statistics, uh, for example, from the United States to, to see this increasing rate. It's exponential. They represent, of course, an increasing burden to society, not only financially, but also emotionally. Think of having autistic children as a parent. They are systemic expressions of dysfunction related to disruption of our highly intricate immune systems, nervous systems, and hormonal systems. They have all been related to pesticide exposure at what time, one time or another in the lifetime of people. Quite a few of them have a higher prevalence among farmers or farm workers and their families. There is a strong wildlife human connection or human wildlife connection, meaning that what we see in wildlife replicates itself among humans. And now, what are the, re the re molecules responsible for these. So you've guessed it already. I want to talk a bit about pesticides and the pesticide problem being an elephant in the room. Um, I don't want to overwhelm you with chemistry or, or uh, uh, com compli complex um, issues, but just have a look at those mo molecules. These are the quite old molecules uh, to the right. You have uh, lindane, chlorticon, and then the three ingredients of Agent Orange, with which the Americans um, uh, killed the, the forests of Vietnam during the war in Vietnam. On the, on the left, you have a few examples of neonicotinoids, which are systemic insecticides. Another slide to move over to more recent pesticides. Uh, well, not DDT, but you know DDT is a, one of the oldest ones and uh, is the, the center of the controversy created by the book of Rachel Carson. But there's other ones that are at least as harm, harmful as DDT and that are still in the running. They are still being marketed. And then a third slide is this is just a, a very, a very uh, short list of molecules. Um, bec why these ones? Succinate dehydrogenase inhibitors or SDH, uh, SDHA. These are fungus, fungicides. There's a whole bunch of them. The, what they have in common is that they disrupt the respiration in cells of both humans. Uh, uh, animals and uh, fungi, um, and a big controversy has erupted about uh, their harmfulness in France, um, and I wanted to show you this as well. So three slides of all kinds of molecules, um, what do, do those molecules have in common? Well, they're all quite small. They are very, very, very small compared to the size of enzymes, proteins, DNA, you name it, the, the very complex molecules that are the machines of the machinery of our organisms. So this means they can really um, find their way into those molecules or onto the, those molecules to block their action are to uh, deform them. I put it very simply. They have a high remanence. As you, uh, as you could see, most of them have aromatic cycles and somewhere on their building blocks, you see chlorine uh, and on the ones of the SDHI um, group, you see fluor. Well, 
they've, they've made that way in purpose to keep um, to keep them uh, as they are, to prevent uh, de degradation. But this means that once they are in the environment, they stay there. They stay there for years, for decades, probably also for centuries. We do not know yet, but we can guess this. Most of those pesticides have been marketed with a claim of specificity of action. One type of plant, one type of insect, one type of fungus, one type of action. But as the evidence shows, most of those molecules have a whole diversity of uh, actions. Each molecule can have a diversity of modes of action with both short and long-term effects depending on those, presence of other molecules, development stage of the exposed organisms. The word endocrine disruption is very important. Most of those molecules, even the ones that are still allowed today, are suspected of having some kind of disruptive action on our hormonal system. And the second um, part of this is that these, this action works at extremely low concentrations, concentrations or doses much lower than uh, expected, uh, sometimes even at the limit of detectability by uh, our analytic machinery. Again, there is a strong human-wildlife connection. And typical for those molecules is that once they are licensed, so once the, the firm can produce them and market them, they stay on the market for some time. And finally, uh, they get thrown out because then, by then, too much evidence has built up proving their toxicity. Unfortunately, these pesticides are the linchpin of corporate agriculture and its der derivatives, say the agro-industry on the one hand and the food industry on the other hand, the food industry relying on cheap ingredients to make their uh, ultra-processed foods. I'm not going to go too deep in this, but just show, show here one table on top. I can't read it on my screen, it's too small. I hope you can read it. It shows um, uh, the fact that we are now, today, the third or the fourth generation being exposed to a, a growing number of molecules with this kind of action. The evidence is building up that babies in, in mother's worms are exposed to what has been accumulating over the previous generations already. They are not uh, you know, virgin uh, slates. They come already with, with their lo load um, in, into the world. The, the diagram in, on the bottom shows that the very first weeks after conception of whatever organism, but this is specifically for humans, are the most vulnerable to some disruption, some, some exposure to some molecule that can like change the track of the development of this organism. And it's here in those stages that you have, you know, the, the, the beginning of the nervous system the hormone system and the immune system being put in place and starting to communicate with one another. So what, I was, what I'm trying to say with this, I know it's very depressing, but I, I, it, keeps, um, it, it keeps being there and not a lot is being said about this. It's a big taboo among farmers, for example. What I'm trying to say is this. On the one hand, you have all those molecules being there, accumulating, um, causing, uh, causing harm. On the other hand, you have this increasing list of non, um, 
non-communicable diseases, but diseases that really destroy lives. Let's try to um, conceptual, conceptualize it like this. So there is time, generation turnover, the one after the other. Um, since the first generation of chemicals, we are at the third or the fourth generation. There is a first axis that, that just shows the chemical diversity of exposure. We could suppose that this is uh, a linear uh, a linear um, accumulation, so uh, not accelerating at a constant rate, more molecules being um, dispersed into the environment. But on the other hand, um, there is um, the chronicity of exposure, the, the, um, the frequency of exposure and the doses the cumulative doses of the diversity of molecules being there, of which we can suspect it's uh, more of an exponential curve. And I think that it should be um, obvious if you, if you read a lot about the literature trying to link up observations of wildlife, uh, experiments on rats and mice in which you can uh, easily go to the third, fourth or fifth generation. And then what you see emerging among humans, these are all puzzles, puzzle pieces, pieces of a puzzle, if you put them together, that show us that pesticides really have, um, really are the elephant in the room. There is again this lag. I'm waiting for the next slide. Okay, just one last um, um, figure. Another way of looking at this is um, um, accepting that you don't exactly know what is there in the environment, but compare whole populations between environments. And here, an anthropologist has looked as the, at the development of uh, small children, toddlers. Um, the same Indian tribe in Mexico, um, some of them were still in the mountains, um, supposedly uh, a better environment with almost no exposure to pesticides. And the valley is the, 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 the place where there, there are a lot of pesticides in some unknown cocktail. You see um, drawings of those children. And um, if you have children yourself, you know that at uh, preschool age, uh, those children get tests to see whether they are able to draw a little a little human being. And if that's the case, they are what they call school ripe. They can go and start, go off and start primary school. Well, the difference between left and right is ex extremely worrying. It, it shows in an indirect way that indeed uh, there are retardations of development because of the exposure to this unknown cocktail of pesticides. So that's the only thing I wanted to say about this health crisis linked to um, uh, pesticides. But those pesticides, as the Human Wildlife Connection says, also have uh, very um, negative effects on biodiversity and ecosystems, also on agriculture, agroecosystems. So again, this empty field, We have all heard about the, the dramatic plunge in insect numbers that has been confirmed by another, by a lot of um, scientific publications. Books have been written about it. Um, it's a fact now. We are losing not only species, but also numbers in insects. And I hope you all are aware of the, their enormous importance in uh, ecosystems and so also in agroecosystems. Just think of pollination services, 
but also the, 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 the degradation of organic matter in the soil. Um, in, in this, uh, insects have a huge role to play as well, and they are auxiliaries to combat pests in, uh, in agriculture. So dramatic plunge in insect numbers, also a dramatic plunge in farmland birds, um, of which the authors say that it is linked to uh, the, the, the major cause of this plunge of farming farmland bird, birds is that they can't get access to enough insects because the insects have been gone be, because of pesticides. So they all point to this same common factor. I'm not, to, um, the, the, these are not the first um, people saying this. Already Rachel Carson said it, and uh, just look at, uh, at the back side of her ori ori original book. We are exposed, not, not sometimes to one molecule uh, in some innocent way, we are constantly facing this. And Rachel's, Rachel Carson, as this woman, T.U. Colborn um, have written about this human wildlife connection. What's happening and what they can observe in wildlife is also happening to humans. Rachel Carson has written her book in, has published her book in 62. T.U. Colborn has written her book, Our Stolen Future, in 96. And still we are there, it's all there, T.U. Colborn was the one to coin the term endocrine disruptors in 96. We are now almost 30 years further and still not much has been done to um, limit the exposure to pesticides in our world. Another author, and he is somebody who has worked with the industry as a toxicologist, is Hank Tennekens. He has died last year of a disease probably caused by his chronic exposure to the insecticides he was working with in the lab. The title of his book is The Systemic Insecticides as Neonicotinoids Are, a Disaster in the Making. So he's really referring to a time bomb for wildlife, not even yet for humans. I just show the first page where you see his outline about the decline of wildlife, according to him, caused by the omnipresence of a cocktail of insecticides that have actions at very, very, very low doses. It's always this story. And these are other books. It's just a sample of the books I have. I collect them. Uh, these are books, both recent and old, already warning us against the negative and very pernicious effects of the buildup of pesticides in our environment. There are reports um, that show how bees have, are being affected by those ne neonicotinoids, which show, sorry, I'm going to skip this, which show how the same observations are being made on uh, morbidity among bees, and here it's about wild bees, and morbidity with human beings. Somewhere on the slide, which I can, can, can't read, you see that the immunity system of bees is being affected, or that the, they can't reprodu reproduce, or that they have lowered um, navigability in the landscape. Neonicotinoids also have effects on uh, earthworms. So we all always uh, read and hear about the link between uh, pollinator decline and neonics, but neonics also affect, for example, earthworms. 
Here you can see their burrowing activity being affected by very, very, very low doses by one of those neonics called imidacloprid. Above you see the, the burrowing activity being declined from uh, left to right by a typical species uh, burrowing, uh, making horizontal burrows. And uh, on the and above, uh, under this, you see um, how the burrowing activity of another type of earthworm is being declined. It's an earthworm that specializes in vertical burrows. For a very, very long time, and that's what I've been told as well at the university, it was being thought, it had been, uh, it had been told, I have been told that um, earthworms are insensitive to pesticides. Um, well, this kind of uh, new research shows that it's not the case at all. Maybe they don't, they don't get killed straight away, but they are quite, uh, seriously affected uh, in their activity and in their, uh, probably also in their reproductive activities. And then a last one that brings me back to farm, farming is um, um, a figure coming from um, an article in Science published in 2002 by Mader et al., a bunch of researchers of the FIBL in Germany, um, reporting on a long-term experiment where side by side, small scale, they compare organic farming with uh, conventional farming, conventional being um, differentiated from the organic uh, version just by the addition of um, uh, synthetic fertilizers and um, pesticides. Um, I hope you can see it for me, but concentrate on the lower spider charts where you can see that the cold colors, um, blue and green, which stand for the organic systems, uh, surpass a lot the warm colors. Warm colors being yellow and red and symbolizing the conventional systems. Um, it's about soil life with, uh, measured with different indicators. It's about micro, micro, um, uh, my, the microbiology, so enzymes, uh, bacteria, fungi, but it's also about the microbiota living in the soil. And those uh, uh, lower two spider charts show conclusive, cons conclusively that after 21 years of uh, farming um, organically and chemically, these are the differences you can expect. And it shows that chemical farming really uh, is detrimental to soil life, uh, whereas organic farming stimulates it. So, okay, that was the negative side. Um, I've been asked also to talk about how you can use food to reconnect not only people among themselves, but also people to the origin of their food. Well, growing awareness of the problem of pesticides is one thing. How do you get there? Uh, not, not probably from, from the moment on you realize now that pesticides are a problem. You have to get there by um, um, a pathway of concrete actions towards uh, the origin of food. And that's what I want to end with. Um, there's three styles of farming in the world. Um, and when I've, when I've been talking about corporate farming, it's just one of those styles. Um, we should know that at the beginning of last century, and up to the end of the Second World War, farming in the world was dominated by peasant farming. The modernization project of this farming has um, moved, this, moved those peasant farmers out towards another type of farming called entrepreneurial farming. Peasant farming and entrepreneurial farming are family farming styles. The farms are run 
uh, by families and its families who do most of the work. But this type of farming, which is still dominant in Europe, is in a crisis again. And um, that's because of the prices. We pay too low for our food. We don't want to pay too much for our food. Cheap food is like a mantra we shouldn't touch, touch upon. This means that the farmers have been pushed out of business because of lower prices since the Second World War. That's the, that's the black curve on top of the figure, of the slide. On the other hand, their inputs they were encouraged to use, such as uh, pesticides with also fertilizer, seeds, uh, machinery, you name it. Those inputs have increased in price. That's the red curve. Farmers go out of business today more and more because the red curve touches the black curve. Uh, farmers can't make a living any longer from farming. So a lot of those farmers quit farming and they make place for uh, the transition to the third style, which is this corporate farming. For many, many reasons, we believe in our group that this is not the way to go. We should, we should find another path to sustainability. Sustainability will want to be found in this corporate uh, uh, farm model because then we lose the family aspect, we lose our last bits of connectivity with the land. So there's another way of doing and farmers show the way already. Um, that is to, to be able to get rid of those external inputs and so to lower the cost of production. So they bend the red curve again to the bottom. That's one way of doing uh, cost reduction. What we see is that it means that uh, farmers uh, let in ecology again in their farm and they, they realize after a few years that ecology is the way in which they can uh, um, make uh, cuts in their uh, costs. So that's a very interesting observation. Ecology um, goes together with economy in that, in, in, that, uh, in that case. So cost reduction is one side, but the other side is that they decide to put themselves the prices on the produce, produce they sell. And instead of price takers, passive price takers, they, bec they become again price makers. In that way, they are not squeezed anymore economically or at least less squeezed. And they are able to keep farming, to keep the size of their farm to get out of, the, out of the scale enlargement uh, race. And we call this representation. That's one word for it. So it's a way of finding back peasantness. But another word um, I use more and more is regrounding. Okay, what, one, what I want to say, what does this have to do with uh, food and the way we have to look at food? My um, view on this is that if we want farmers to go back to a peasant way of farming, modern peasants of course, of course peasants of the 21st century, and we would like to get rid of the corporate farming style or as much as possible. We want, we want this regrounding. Uh, we should be aware that um, corporate farming is in a way uh, typical and correlated with one type of households ca called the uprooted urban individuals. Um, completely deconnected from the origin of their food. Where we are now is more the setting of urbanized families, uh, urbanized households, where we are losing that connection, but it's not too late yet. Whereas um, families that live in a peasant way, we, we could call them rooted. 
my uh, view on the regrounding process is that if we want farmers to reground from entrepreneurial styles to peasant styles, we as a family or as a household, we have to do the same. Otherwise, they won't be able to survive. Um, and for the moment, there's no way I can uh, envision a future without farmers, so we need them to survive. This is my last slide. So what are my tips to, to make it a little bit more positive and optimistic? I've shown you this list of very depressing diseases. Um, sometimes it's not too late when a disease like this shows up. We can use the trigger of this health crisis in our household to change some things, especially the way we treat food. So my advice is try to cook more. Even if you have a very busy life, try to cook more for yourself. See the, thera the therapeutic value of it. Eat out less or be at least very picky uh, about your restaurants, for example, the Nordic uh, restaurants, and get rid of your ultra-processed foods. But you can go further. You can become ever more pickier on your ingredients. Um, prefer fresh ingredients, organic if possible, seasonal, uh, no tomatoes in winter, for example, and certainly no strawberries at Christmas. And um, but become literate about this. What is normal for this type of the season? And buy them as local as possible. This means you have to educate yourself. You have to educate yourself also to be able to reduce animal food as much as possible, but don't phase it, phase it out completely. As Tim said, try to find the meat that has been grown in accordance with the principles of mixed farming. Start a conversation. Matt said this. Uh, try to talk about it. Keep it into the conversation. Start a conversation about food wherever you can, as especially when you're eating something. The next step could be try to grow some of it yourself as much as feasible. And then you're really hand and feet in the ground and you start realizing how vulnerable we have all become because we don't know anymore how to grow food. Start a conversation with farmers, try to understand the lock-in they have themselves, um, they are in themselves. Try to um, understand why, for example, they still believe they need pesticides. And do this wherever you go, also when you're on your holidays. Because farming is everywhere. Then understand that animals are part and parcel of a healthy farm. So don't be too vegan. It's unsustainable to ask from the world to be vegan. We need animals for a healthy farm life. And finally, grow literate on that eternal and universal farm food nexus that connects us all. Thank you. <laughs>